Morning, if we can start. Welcome to the second day of our conference. I hope yesterday was interesting. I'm certain today is not going to be less interesting than yesterday. It can only get better. So uh, uh, what I would like to do is now uh, to uh, give you a few information. First of all, we're going to have the pleasure of uh, Brian Schneiderman on behalf of Central EFA addressing us. Uh, then Valentin Slavov, the president of EFA Bulgaria, will give you a short uh, introduction into a great event uh, the Bulgarian EFA is preparing for the 8th and the 9th of November in Sofia, uh, the first day of which is dedicated to VAT. So, because afterwards, Professor Ado Buffon and his team of, uh, I think, six panelists will hold our first panel today, which is dedicated to the digitalization of the VAT process, both from a formal and from a material perspective. So we have excellent panelists. We have uh, panelists from Poland. We have panelists from Romania. We have panelists from Serbia. Uh, so in, in this respect, this is going to be an, uh, a really interesting panel. So I invite you all to participate. And now I'm going to give the word to Brian Schneider. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I can say Sveta, eh? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how to do it. Uh, well, my name is Brian Schneiderman, and I'm from uh, Montreal, Canada. I was supposed to be here Wednesday afternoon. Unfortunately, the airplane was diverted over mid-Atlantic due to a medical uh, emergency, and so we flew back to Canada. So uh, I had one job here, and that was to introduce Robert Danon, who spoke yesterday, and to bring a bit of a message from uh, Central IFA. So please forgive me if you've heard what I've already had to say, because I understand that Svetislav introduced Robert and talked a bit about Central IFA. Uh, over the years, I've had the privilege of serving as chair of the Canadian branch, and now the privilege of being on the executive committee of IFA Central. And one of my particular tasks is to chair a subcommittee on uh, regional activities. And where that led Central IFA to was in 2015 and 2016, the entire, well, it's, let me back up a step, IFA Central Executive Committee meets twice a year, once in the spring and once during the annual congresses. And in the spring of 2015 and then in 2016, first we met in uh, Seoul, Korea, and then in Singapore, uh, the entire executive committee of about 20 people to support the region. And while we were discussing the regions, we said, well, we've got this fabulous region in Central and Eastern Europe, and wouldn't it be great if we could, uh, well, bring the, the message of the IFA family to Central and Eastern Europe. So we conceived of the idea that instead of displacing everyone to travel to one uh, city somewhere and be away from their offices and have the hotel expenses and the travel expenses, wouldn't it be great if we could take the panels to the branches? And so we conceived of this idea, we took it through the approval process, and then I think it was at the representatives of Central and Eastern Europe at the IFA Congress in Madrid in 2016, we met with the representatives and we placed the uh, idea before them. And uh, one of the most enthusiastic participants was Svetislav, and he said, yes, uh, that would be a great idea and we can make it happen. And of course, last year in 2017, we did exactly that. I mean, originally the idea was to take one professor to give the same course in nine or ten cities and then we realized it would be totally exhausting and of course people have to make a living <laughs> and uh, we just couldn't take somebody away for uh, 10 to 20 days to travel to 10 different countries uh, but it even worked out uh, better than that because we got four professors of the highest level Robert Dano who you know spoke yesterday and uh, uh, Guillermo Maisto and David Duff of Canada and Philip Baker and we went to uh, Warsaw 
and we went to Prague, and we went to uh, Belarus and Slovenia and Bosnia Herzegovina, and Belgrade and Kiev and Sofia. And the I have to tell you that there was over 600 to 700 people who did attend, and. Uh, the, I had the privilege of uh, visiting uh, Warsaw, uh, Ljubljana, Kiev, and Sofia, and the level of enthusiasm that I uh, observed in Central and Eastern Europe was just terrific. It was wonderful, and the friends that I got to, to meet, uh, well, they're still good friends, and I've been meeting more, and I met them yesterday. So. Uh, this morning I awoke to an email from Robert Danon, and I have to tell you that he sort of channeled my feelings. Because I wasn't here the day earlier, when I did come in at 3 o'clock yesterday, I noticed exactly what he said. I was truly impressed by the level of participation of the audience and the quality of the exchanges. And that's, and that's what I noticed yesterday. It was, it was just terrific and uh, I was very very impressed and I was delighted to be here yesterday and today and I have to tell you at the end of the meeting you said will the foreigners stick around you know and it's not always exciting to be labeled as a foreigner but I have to tell you um, Yesterday's evening, there was about 30 of us, and I, I thank you. I'm not thanking you on behalf of everybody else. Let them thank you on their, on their own. But uh, we were taken to the museum of the National Museum, the National Museum which uh, we had our own private showing and our own docent to take us around, and we had a, a delightful dinner. And I'm just repeating that in each of the countries that I went to last year, there was that similar warmth uh, of, of the region, and I, I see great things happening in this region. So, um, now I, I told you that the uh, airplane turned back, and so instead of having uh, one day of jet lag, they took us back, we sat on the tarmac for five hours, they then put us in a motel for 12 hours, and we left at the same time. But there was a silver lining. I had, uh, as we seem to all be doing now, is that we prepay these hotels because they make it so tempting for you. And of course, you never think you're going to cancel. But I phoned them and I said, look, I can't make it. And I have to tell you, we're just next door to the Metropole. And, and they couldn't have been friendlier. Uh, they said, don't worry. We won't. I really didn't call to get my money back for the day. I called, don't give away my room. I am going to attend. Um, so there was a silver lining as I came through and I was greeted and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Schneiderman, uh, we can't give you your money back, but we're going to give you the presidential suite. <laughs> so I said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Anyways, I want to tell you, I have a hotel room that's three times the size of this conference room. <laughs> so, uh, now, uh, so if the lights go out here, we can hold the meeting <laughs> in my room. There's just one problem. It's only, I'm only allowed two adults, so you can have <laughs> one at a time. Anyways, thank you. That's all I have to say, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, now I would like to ask our friends from uh, Bulgaria, Nifa, Valentin Savo, who's here, here with us today, uh, to tell us about the great event they're preparing in, uh, in a month, uh, not even a month and a half, in five weeks. Yes, yes indeed. Okay, good morning. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here again. And I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Dejan Popovic and Dr. Svetislav Krstic for uh, the organization of this great uh, conference and for the interesting topics and for the excellent speakers. And in Bulgaria, what we're doing, we're going to organize our second international conference. It will take place on 8th and 9th of November. It's a two-day conference. And uh, the first day, 
is dedicated to the future of VAT. So tackle any developments, future or current developments in the, in the um, field of VAT. And we have speakers, representatives from the European Commission, and as you can see on the, on the slide, uh, professors uh, from uh, European universities and practitioners. Um, Dr. Sek will be also one of the speakers at the conference. The second day is dedicated to digital economy. <laughs> this will be happy to hear actually the opinions of the European Commission, of the um, OECD, in the, in the face of uh, Sophie Chateau and of course of the Bulgarian Ministry of Finance. We have also prominent professors who are going to be speakers at the, at the panels. The, la, um, the venue will take place in Sofia University in the Aual Magna <coughs> and we will have a cocktail on the 8th of uh, November. This is Thursday evening. So uh, we will be happy to greet you in Sofia in five weeks. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, being able to start at 9.15, <laughs> according to the best uh, East European standards, so including the academic uh, quarter. Uh, first of all, I want to thank for uh, the organization, the efforts made by the Serbian branch of IFA, uh, especially to Professor Popovic, and I want here to make a remark. Unfortunately, Romania doesn't have in his generation, somebody of this size, as academic, as uh, scientific. And, of course, to Svetislav, uh, he will lose about uh, 20 kilo after uh, <laughs> finishing this, uh, this uh, event. Also, I want to thank the people who helped me last year to continue the idea. So it was a good conference organized in Cluj, in Klausenburg, or Kolozhvar in Transylvania. And they are, uh, they are Ciprian Perun and uh, Diana Feldrihan from ho his team. And especially I want to thank to the Polish uh, guests which, were, uh, which came every time they were invited in Romania. Uh, and uh, uh, our big, uh, big friend, Professor Nickel, last year, traveled from Warsaw to Istanbul and back to Cluj, also uh, due to a flying uh, to a to a plane problem. <coughs> uh, my uh, main goal, so uh, seeing the, the, the schedule of the event organized by Valentin, probably we have to cancel this panel because they will speak two days about digitalization. Uh, what I want to say is that I, I, uh, I'm too old to understand everything happening in, uh, in the digital uh, uh, context. I'm wondering how could I live 20 years ago without having an iPhone. Yesterday we were three people having four iPhones to look for the restaurant in Belgrade. <laughs> and it was difficult to, to get it. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, we have here the professionals of the, of the VAT, and uh, uh, I don't know why uh, Svetislav was so angry on me, giving me the charge to read everything which was written till now on the, on the digitalization. Uh, the first lecture I can recommend you in the evening for a good sleeping is the Action 1 of the BEPS. So they are about 300 pages uh, about addressing the tax challenges of the digital economy. It's a very good lecture for sleeping. Okay, so you need about one month to be aware about. So there are things which are repeating. So uh, one part, there are some, an some appendixes which are, which are developing in analytical skill what was written in the report. 
also probably you know my my last uh, uh, and uh, that is a paper I found a very interesting paper written by a certain guy Wolfgang Schön from Munich uh, uh, the article is 10 questions about why and how to tax the digitalized economy appeared in the bulletin of the IBFD in April my May this year is a very good article written by an famous academic about should we or not reconsider our concepts in order to face the problems raised by the digital economy. So we have, in order to have a, an, uh, if uh, I, let me guess that not everybody in the room has a master in IT. Okay, so if this is the true, my assumption is true, I will, uh, I will try to ask my, uh, my distinguished speakers to, to be human and to remain human, to understand that we are ordinary humans and we don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about uh, what they are, uh, uh, they are thinking behind the slides. Fortunately, each of them has maximum 10 slides. So we will survive, and uh, the, the goal is to finish at 11 sharp, because our friend Raffaele Petrucci has a lot of news, much more, much more, uh, uh, much more uh, understandable for, for us than the digital uh, uh, problems. Uh, in the panel, we have uh, two distinguished ladies. We have Margot Zatasek from the University of Uj in Poland, and we have Jovana uh, uh, Stojanovic from PwC uh, Serbia, and uh, uh, the idea was to put the two w PwC people one after the other because you will not distinguish the slides, they are on the same standard, okay, and this uh, Alexandro Antonescu from PwC Romania. I want to confess that I was 10 years uh, with the uh, Kubas and Liban and PwC, and I'm still alive. <laughs> and uh, uh, also we have uh, from, uh, from Poland, we have our friend uh, Professor uh, Krzysztof flaszynski sulecki from the Torun University. And uh, uh, of course, my friend uh, Ciprian Paun from the Babes Boyo University in Cluj, which is uh, younger than me and much more familiar with the technology. So I will also ask him to try to, uh, to keep the discussion at a very human level, okay? And trying to understand, because I, uh, what I understood from, from the plans that we still have some years, okay? We still have two, three years those changes will be implemented. So if we are going to three seminars every year, in two years, I personally, I will probably be able to, to understand what, what happens. So, Giovanna, is your, uh, you are the first, okay? Please. Thank you. So, as announced, I'm Giovanna Stojanovic, Senior Indirect Tax Manager in PwC, uh, dealing primarily with uh, VAT since Actually, it's introduction in Serbia. So what my topic today is Serbian digital environment and VAT challenges associated with it. We are not that far from the rest of the world. And when we generally are speaking about new digital economy, it's completely new to say economic activity based on millions of connections Sorry, I'm not sure. Based on millions of connections between individuals, companies, data and devices. The primary source and driver within this digital transformation is definitely data. And with various tools that have been developed so far, it creates a number of opportunities for the individual businesses and the organizations. Where Serbia is on this agenda. 
well known in Serbia, uh, digital transformation is one of the key priorities of Serbian government. And this stands for obvious reasons. Currently, uh, actually, IT sector uh, contributes to 10% of gross domestic products. And IT industry is one of the biggest exporters in the country. Apart from just proclaiming that this is our priority, a number, to say, of projects have been either done or ongoing. For example, we have deployment of e-government. We have also, had, and all those processes and projects are going on more or less at the same time. So my overall impression is that currently and in near future we will be quite tectonic area moving from one to say fixed economy towards really uh, new trends and approaching to the trends of course in the rest of the world also there was a big project uh, of simplifying administrative procedures also their digitalization uh, abolishment of stamp finally in uh, Serbia and uh, currently it's also one uh, great achievement I would say it's development of legal framework for e-business and e-documents and everything that is associated with it simply it's not just the matter that you will have the law let's say on e-signature Serbian economy and Serbian administration is heavily hard copy uh, based, meaning that we are used on papers and why I'm referring to this in the area of VAT. We know that VAT is focused on individual transactions and uh, it's based on paper. Either whether we look from the side of the seller or from the side of the of the customer this project will mean that slightly we will move towards actually digital uh, administration either if we are talking from the angle of the administration or business operations and what i found also interesting uh, because so far I was talking uh, what the government and policy makers with all of us currently are doing in Serbia. But it's interesting to compare to facts and figures that recently have been published by the Serbian Statistical Bureau. Uh, it is the publication on the development of ICT information and communication technology in Serbia, both for individuals and for companies. This is interesting because it shows us not only where we want to be, but on the other side as well, where we are currently. And when I compare at least data published by OSCD, we are much in line with the rest of the world. For example, more than 17% of adults are using inter internet, and it was interesting for me to see that the great majority is using internet for the purpose of finding appropriate information about goods and services. On the other side, when we are talking about e-commerce, uh, around 31% of population, we are talking of course uh, about adult population, uh, has used internet for the purchases, online purchases of goods and services. And yes, what is interesting also here when we are talking about the individuals, for example, cloud services or storage of files uh, is used 21.3%. And this, those are the facts uh, relevant for individuals and where the companies are. For example, for cloud services, uh, we have around 15.5%. And this is maybe the most interesting fact for me. 95.9% uh, of companies are still issuing invoices in hard copy. So this shows us that still we need to, and we have a good way to go through. But of course, it's very important to have proper and good legal 
framework to be able to implement actually uh, appropriate uh, practice. When we are talking about e-commerce, we see here that almost 27% of companies received orders via internet and of course uh, we are much improved and uh, to say because in this report it's also provided some comparison to previous uh, years when we are talking about connection to the internet it's similar uh, you can see that it's quite booming industry in Serbia and this is why this is very relevant for Serbia and I must say Serbia is on well track comparing to the EU. And where is the link with the VAT? I would say that maybe the biggest challenge when we are talking about digital industry and the fast growing activities is for tax policy makers because you need to be very flexible here to be able to respond to uh, new business models to new products but on the other side also to provide uh, 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 actually uh, not only the flexibility but to provide also uh, uh, certainty uh, towards the business players and this is very hard to to achieve but uh, let's talk about some specific to say issues i uh, put here the not issues challenges maybe better to say that are quite common for the rest of the world and also alex will later on uh, talk about a uh, new uh, package uh, in the eu uh, but those issues are not Serbian sourced issues, if I can say. Uh, and on the other side, we are facing with them. For some, we still do not have solutions and we will need time to, uh, to resolve. Yes, one important thing which I forgot to mention is that we are in process of the harmonization very active process of the harmonization with the eu uh, rules and laws and professor popovic uh, yesterday mentioned uh, at least we hope next year we will have uh, uh, this chapter 16 opened uh, and in the latest report of european commission from this year uh, which uh, deals with the progression of serbia on this way uh, it was mentioned and acknowledged that a lot of things have been introduced. You have in Serbia, for example, regarding VAT, really huge legal framework consisting on, of one law and 28 various rule books and uh, decrees. And it's good framework but on the other side we still need to implement some solutions and also rules associated with the eu what is also acknowledged as a big i would say condition for the opening of this chapter it is the transformation and reorganization of tax administration which is also ongoing Let's come back to, to those issues uh, or challenges. I, I, in purpose, avoid to call it issues because this is simply we need to resolve and this challenge is coming simply from the development of IT industry and new technology. The first thing is importation of low value goods. We have uh, in the European Union, most often I will uh, make comparison with the EU because there is where we want to, to be in the near future. We have the exemption of uh, small value consignments uh, uh, of the value between 10 and 22 euros. And what the situation is in Serbia, for example. I was quite surprised to see that uh, in Serbia, we do not have this threshold for VAT purposes. So my conclusion was, okay, we are here maybe advanced because we do not have threshold meaning, uh, threshold for exemption, meaning that everything is whatever you import, uh, apart from importation from uh, individuals, is subject to VAT. 
we have for customs duty available exemption uh, uh, for the value of goods not above 50 euros. And then I purchase something online and got the goods without customs and without VAT and the value of these goods were below 50 euros. In practice, customs authorities due, of course, uh, again, uh, there is a reason for that, uh, uh, due to large number of imports, and this uh, uh, number of imports is increasing drastically in recent years, uh, they usually, to say, do not charge VAT on the importation. I'm referring to customs authorities because customs authorities is in charge for the collection of VAT on import. Why? Because as the same reason was for introduction of the, this threshold in the EU, simply when you compare the costs you have to charge it and the level of revenue you will get, it can't compare. But on the other side, we really have significant increase in the number of these shipments. So the real question is, who is losing, actually. Apart from this, but we have, as I said, for this importation, we have legal framework, only we need to, to implement it. The another question is application of destination principle to services and intangible. Famous destination principle that is a norm now, and it's logical uh, to have it associated with the application of VAT because VAT is consumption tax and it will be logically to tax the consumption, meaning at the location of customer. Uh, for digital services, uh, this is uh, sometimes very hard to apply because imagine you buy application or vendor, some developer sitting who knows where, is placing application on Apple Store or different marketplaces, and you simply download it, it purchase it, and behind it, if we are talking about VAT, you can have a number of compliance areas that you need to take care about. Uh, EU have quite detailed rules, for example, how to determine the location of your customer. So uh, Serbia did not went that far. For example, Serbia has harmonized the list of services that shall be regarded as provided electronically. But for example, why in the EU this list is, the list is indicative uh, in Serbia is definite. And on the other side, this is where within the current uh, framework, Serbia stops. So we do not have any further rules how, for example, to determine where this application was bought, whether you will use, for example, SIM cards or zip code or uh, original bank. So there are number of uh, things that you need to consider in order to dedicate what the location of your customer is. With the digital economy, it's not easy uh, at all in this area. Uh, while in the EU, uh, you have guideline uh, uh, associated with it, uh, actually pointing out and giving the examples of the transaction flow because why this is complicated. It's easy when I say you simply sell the application, but in between, you may have mobile operator, payment service provider, in number of intermediaries. So when you look the chain, it can be quite complicated. So this is, for example, the area where we need to go a little far away, of course, to harmonize with the new developments in the EU. And the most interesting topic for me is the VAT treatment of uh, new technologies, meaning new type of services and also new technology solutions. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, why I'm mentioning this? Uh, last year, I think it was last year, the Serbian Ministry of Finance 
issued the opinion on the VAT treatment of digital currencies, meaning bitcoins. Uh, Ministry of Finance took the approach that actually this is vatable. And I was, uh, to be honest, a bit surprised when I read uh, this opinion because what the opinion is saying, the exemption, VAT exemption, that apply on money currencies and legal tenders cannot be applied here. And we were wondering, okay, it's not exempted, but what is it? In terms, because for VAT purposes, you need first of all to determine the nature of supply, whether this is voucher, uh, whether this is barter arrangement between the parties. And we have also a great ECJ case from 2015, uh, but ECJ decided more on, I would say, uh, substance over form principle, saying that in substance you are using this currency for the payment operation. So it, there should be equalization between uh, uh, these digital cu currencies and money. Uh, to come back to, to this question, uh, what it is and uh, insufficient, if I can say, information from the Ministry of Finance, later on I realized that Ministry of Finance couldn't go far from what they have said. Because for a number of those things that are new one, you need to have the proper legal framework. So it's not the Ministry of Finance to decide what in legal terms this is. This is, for example, the National Bank of Serbia. So we need to have here proper legal background in order to allow policymakers and uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance to decide on VAT treatment of, of those. Also, interesting thing is uh, actually 3D printing. Uh, I hope all of you are aware of uh, what is 3D printing. For those that do not, 3D printing <coughs> means that simply I, as a vendor, send you a file. You have machine, you have this printer, you are using some fibers of plastics and various materials, and you, as a purchaser and as a customer, at your place, actually is producing these goods. It's very similar as printing, but the, the material is different. And really the question is, because VAT traditionally assumes the chain, production, distribution, consumption, let, let's make it uh, simple. Uh, but now we have the company who is sending some file over the internet, and myself as a customer is using that for production and for consumption. So what it is, what this transaction uh, really is. Of course, we have other uh, uh, problems here, but as I'm limited in time, I will not go beyond this. Uh, but I must go through this slide and I will try really to, to be fast uh, due to limited time. So when we are talking about this, Simple sale. Why I'm saying simple sale? For me, uh, trade over the internet and e-commerce is like sale on click. But on the other side, you really have huge compliance matters that you need to consider. You need to consider where do you sell, uh, sell as I explained previously, on the, as a foreign, foreign uh, vendor. You need to consider to whom you are selling. In Serbia, as similar in the EU and uh, the most of the rest of the world, uh, B2B transactions, E transactions, uh, uh, implies the application of reverse charge. And this generally is not problematic, but it is the problem if we are talking about B2C, so a sale to, to customers who are not VAT payers generally. <laughs> then, who is partly a uh, party who is liable to comply. Usually, as in Serbia, it is the foreign vendor. So foreign vendor needs to consider what he sells on Serbian market, what rates applies. <coughs> in most of the cases, it will be uh, general Serbian VAT rate. But I expect with the 
actually development uh, of technologies that we will quite often have really bundled supplies uh, consisting on many items that it would be very difficult to conclude what it represents and what rate we need to, to apply. And then we are coming to the obligation, I'm again referring to Serbia, of foreign vendor for B2C supplies of services provided electronically to register in Serbia. Our registration implies uh, actually uh, appointment of the fiscal representative who is jointly and severely uh, liable for all compliance uh, matters uh, relevant for a uh, foreign vendor. Uh, Serbia do not have any simplification measures in this respect. So once you appoint fiscal representative, you're, you are obliged, because uh, with the appointment of fiscal representative, you need also to account uh, VAT for B2B transactions. So for B2B to issue the invoice, invoice is not necessary for B2C, but to keep records, to submit uh, 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 VAT form and PDV. So all the things, all the rights that are associated with the VAT payer and their <coughs> obligations are connected with the foreign vendors through appointment of fiscal representative. Uh, but what is here specifically interesting, uh, and I uh, agree here with one of the OECD comments, is that still we have quite voluntarily based registration for VAT. Because what will happen if foreign vendors do not appoint fiscal re uh, uh, representative? Almost we have penalty within our tax procedure and tax administration law, but the first question is whether the tax authorities and the other authorities can track those transactions. And also maybe this is the question for other uh, uh, panelists, and I will end with this, not to take further uh, time, uh, about the experience in other countries, because we have the penalty if you do not register. And this is the fixed amount going up to 16,000 euros, if I remember well. But you will not be charged or imposed with VAT liability for the period in which you have been liable to register and account for. So more or less you are faced only with potential penalty, and this is also the question in case you do not register how it's possible to, to track at all. And, in, and this is why I agree with OECD that it is quite uh, voluntary still uh, based, but as in other economies, still we do not have mechanism to track it and appropriately to say uh, deal with, uh, with that. And apart from this, uh, we have all other compliance responsibilities. So when you look into this, you see how steps, how many steps you have to comply versus one click sale. That's it only if we can briefly discuss about what they meant. Thank you very much. Uh, PW, I will consider that this was uh, the time, uh, the additional time was consumed for the, from the PWC time. No. So, Alexandro, <laughs> Alexandro I, it's not fair to, to make people traveling hundreds of kilometers to not have the same time available as the guests. Okay? So, as any guests. Alexandro, please, in 20 minutes. Alexandro Antonescu is coming from Romania, and uh, uh, Daniel Angel, his boss, was the former uh, PwC regional partner for VAT, and now Daniel is the head of the tax practice of PwC Romania. That's right. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, so I'm Alex, uh, manager within PwC in Bucharest. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure seeing so many of you. 
Uh, we're going to talk today uh, briefly, I understand, about the uh, VT e-commerce package in the EU. Um, for starters, what's, what's e-commerce? Uh, it's goods, whether they come from uh, other EU member states, into another EU member state, or from outside the community, into the community, and also um, services, yeah? Um, that's generally e-commerce. Um, in the EU, um, trade, but in particular e-commerce, uh, has shown uh, <laughs> some problems in, in recent years. Uh, some of these problems are that uh, taxpayers uh, incur very high VAT costs with compliance. Uh, member state budgets uh, lose uh, a lot of revenues. And also, uh, there's some uh, differences in treatment between uh, EU suppliers and non-EU suppliers. And this is the background for the reason why the EU has decided to uh, change the VT treatment uh, in place for these transactions. Um, so, the aim is to facilitate cross-border trade to ensure fair competition and to combat VT fraud which is primarily the main uh, trigger behind it. Um, this e-commerce package was adopted last year by, by, by the Council. Uh, it's uh, three main acts, two regulations and one directive. The directive needs to be transposed into the local legislations by all member states. Regulations are directly uh, applicable. They just need to be uh, translated and member states can uh, use them as such. Uh, bear in mind that what we're going to talk today is just uh, general guidelines. The technical details are yet to be published, but they're supposed to uh, appear uh, later this year. Um, th this, this entire package that we're talking about covers two steps. Uh, it's the, the 2019 step and then the 2021 step, which is more substantial. Um, the, the, the first one, uh, it's more of an uh, administrative nature and it's not that substantial and it covers only services, whereas the second step, 2021, uh, you know, it, it shows more substance and it covers both services and goods. All right. Um, you may have heard about the notion of mass. Uh, this is the mini one-stop shop. Uh, it's a concept in the EU which uh, covers services. Uh, when, so when we're talking about um, uh, telecom, uh, broadcasting, TV, and electronically supplied services uh, that are provided in the uh, electronic <laughs> environment, yes, yeah, so e-commerce. And when we're talking about B2C supplies of goods, that is where the buyer of the services is, is a, the final consumer, so an individual, let's say. And when these supplies, um, they are cross-border, yeah? Uh, so when, when, you, when you have all these conditions uh, cumulatively met, that, that means that uh, in general terms, uh, such suppliers, whether they are EU or non-EU, they would be required to register for VAT purposes in all of the 28 member states where they have such uh, customers buying these services. Yeah, the registration the registration is needed in order for the suppliers to be able to uh, collect VAT and pay to the state budget. So just imagine uh, what what it, it would mean for such a supplier. Uh, having customers throughout the entire EU to be required to register and comply with various rules in each of the uh, still 28 member states, right? It would be totally chaos. So this is why uh, some years ago uh, the EU invented this mechanism, a MAS, a mini one-stop shop, uh, which basically means that um, suppliers uh, can choose uh, a member state in principle and in this member state, uh, they do one single registration. Uh, they charge VT for all the supplies that they do throughout the EU. 
they pay to the state budget of the, that country that they opt for, and then that country uh, redistributes the VAT amount to the rest of the countries depending on the proportion of those supplies and the total revenues of that supply, right? Uh, so this was a huge deal because it, it facilitated this type of trade uh, a lot. Um, yeah, so the idea behind it is simplified compliance. Uh, problem with this is that, as I told you, uh, currently it covers only these three types of services. It's uh, telecom, it's broadcasting, and electronically supplied services. And then, you know, the commission, uh, you know, time passed and they, they analyzed it and they say, you know, uh, if, if it works uh, so good, what, why not uh, extend it? So, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they are going to extend it in 2021 um, together with goods. But before that, that there's this first step, uh, which I said is the, the 2019 step. Uh, which covers just an, let's say, an improvement of the of the mini one-stop shop for services. Um, they've uh, they've decided uh, upon two thresholds. Uh, one of them is uh, ten thousand euro, and it's uh, regarding the place of supply. So, if suppliers uh, have revenues below this threshold, they're going to charge VAT from their home countries, which is a lot easier. And if if the threshold is exceeded, only then they're gonna like you know go to the member state of actual consumption and charge VT in that member state. Um, then there's the second threshold. This is the 100,000 euro. Uh, it's regarding the uh, evidence needed to identify the place of, of the uh, supplier. Um, there's some trouble in identifying the place where the customer actually uh, is, yeah? Because let, let's take the most simple example. It's an in, in internet cafe, yeah? Uh, you can go to an internet cafe which is located in a, a, a specific country, so there's this server indicating a country. But then the person can have an address uh, in its ID, in his, his or her ID, in another different state. And then it can have a, a card which is issued by a different country. <laughs> and then when the supplier takes a look at all these pieces of information, they need to decide upon the location uh, of the customer. So it's really complicated. So currently, um, uh, there is a need for two pieces of non-contradictory uh, evidence in order to indicate the exact location of the customer. And this is really burdensome for taxpayers. And starting next year, they're going to simplify this, uh, and they're going to ask for only one a single piece of evidence uh, if sales are below this 100,000 threshold. Uh, again, currently, suppliers need to meet customer location invoicing rules. Uh, starting next year, they're going to uh, take a look at the invoicing rules in their uh, home countries, suppliers' home countries. Um, Right now, if you are a non-EU supplier, so if you are a Serbian supplier, let's say, uh, providing such services to an individual within the EU, uh, if by any chance you are VAT registered in the EU for any other types of supplies, uh, you cannot use the mini one-stop shop scheme. Uh, you know, this was apparently a mistake, and now the, the commission is uh, willing to correct it. And starting next year, it doesn't matter whether you're registered or not for other types of transactions in the EU. You can still uh, apply the MAS scheme uh, if you do such transactions. <coughs> uh, right, coming to the uh, most uh, substantial step, the 2021, um, as I said, uh, they're going to extend the MAS scheme uh, not only to services but also to uh, goods and we're going to go through uh, each of them individually. So, uh, the services part. Uh, right now, uh, we've said that we've got only telecom, broadcasting, and electronic supply services. Uh, we're going to be able to use the scheme for all types of services. So, as long as it's cross-border and it's uh, B2C, uh, we're going to be able to use the MAS and avoid multiple uh, jurisdiction registrations. Um, also, uh, we've said that uh, we're going to extend it to uh, goods. Now, when it comes to goods, uh, there's two flows. It's goods coming from the EU, which currently they're called 
distance sales so it's what we do when we buy stuff from Amazon let's say and uh, yeah uh, we just <coughs> order stuff online uh, right now uh, in the EU there's local thresholds and pretty much uh, such suppliers uh, if they sell goods in a certain country uh, below these thresholds they need to charge VAT in their home countries if they exceed these thresholds they need to register in the country of destination of the goods and then charge VAT uh, over there uh, also currently there is uh, no mini stop shop uh, facility so they need to register in all 28 member states if they send goods uh, in all these states also suppliers are required to issue invoices um, starting 2021, when these uh, new changes uh, are going to be in place, uh, there's, uh, there's going to be a standard uh, threshold, so there's, there's not going to be a local different thresholds, it's going to be a 10,000 euro threshold and it's going to refer to all supplies performed uh, within the EU. This is meant pretty much to uh, encourage uh, small and medium enterprises. And of course, compliance and payment, they're going to walk through the uh, mass, uh, which is going to be called actually us, because it's no longer a mini one-stop shop, so it's no longer mini, it's going to be maxi. So they've just removed the, the M, and there's only the us left. So it's one-stop shop. And also no more invoicing for such uh, supplies. Um, of course, you can also order stuff online, uh, even if the goods come from uh, non-EU countries. Uh, currently, in the EU, there is this uh, exemption tre threshold that was talked about earlier. Uh, it's, it ranges between 10 and 22 uh, euros. Currently, uh, if imports are below this value, then no VT is due because it's not worth it. Um, there is no uh, compliance, so uh, there's no uh, mini on stop shop compliance. So if you do make imports above this threshold, then you have to, you know, uh, see what obligations are in each member state. You cannot like con consolidate them. Um, also, VT is paid uh, in customs, and then you have to see how you get it back, whether you can deduct it via local VT return, or maybe you can file via. Uh, a directive refund um, yeah and pretty much no specific compliance requirements so it's just the general ones uh, uh, besides mass what they want to do uh, in, in a few years uh, it's uh, they're gonna eliminate this uh, threshold uh, so that means that uh, all imports towards individuals are going to be subject to uh, VAT. Uh, they're going to make uh, a scheme for imports, which is similar to the uh, uh, one for uh, services that we've talked about earlier. Um, this scheme, however, is optional and it's going to be able to be used only if uh, supplies are below uh, a new threshold 100 50 euro. If uh, you sell more than this, then you cannot go it through. You cannot take it through the through the scheme. Uh, they're going to split imports in two two types of transactions only for that purposes. Meaning that uh, the actual uh, import is going to be exempt, whereas you're going to be considered to perform a local supply towards your supplier, and you're going to be, you know, you're going you're to have to charge uh, VAT and pay it like through the uh, uh, us uh, return so through the VAT return so no longer in customs as uh, as before um, yeah so new uh, new returns this uh, us returns you're gonna have to appoint uh, uh, a new intermediary of course if you are a, a, a supplier established uh, outside the community and that member state where the import is made <coughs> does not have uh, you know some um, a mutual assistance tool with them with the state where you as a supplier are established um, last but not least um, this iOS scheme is optional uh, if you do not use it you can you know, go through the regular procedure uh, however member states are going to be required to uh, 
uh, implement this uh, simplified procedure, so uh, uh, a facilitation regarding registration and compliance. Uh, they're going to be also, uh, um, uh, although customers, individuals remain liable for VT, it's the suppliers that are going to need to collect that VT and enforce some measures in order to be able to uh, to be able to get that VAT. Uh, VAT is going to be due upon payment, so whenever the, customers, the customer pays uh, for, for the goods, that's when VAT becomes due. Uh, and yeah, they're going to be, uh, such suppliers are going are to be able to, are going to be required to keep uh, records for whatever they're doing uh, for a 10 years, year period, just like everybody else. Finally, um, electronic uh, interfaces, whether it's platforms, marketplaces, or portals, uh, so far at EU level they haven't actually been, uh, let's say, included in the process of VT collection, but not anymore. Starting 2021, um, if you sell goods and you use such a platform, that platform is going to be considered as a buyer reseller only for that purposes. That means that they're going to they're going to be considered to buy those goods and further on sell them to the uh, to the final customers. That means that whatever obligations uh, lied uh, before with the actual supplier of the goods are uh, now is shifted to uh, such marketplaces. Uh, that are going to need to know, you know, about the nature of the goods. They're going to be, uh, they're going to have to know about VAT rules in the countries of arrival and all that stuff. So it's it's a new level of compliance uh, for um, for electronic uh, uh, interfaces. Um, this is um, uh, the, the new element is only for goods because for services we already have it right now. But yeah, for goods, uh, all these all these types of new uh, uh, EIs are gonna are gonna face a whole lot of new uh, challenges. Uh, that's in brief uh, the story of the e-commerce package in the EU. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, <laughs> you succeeded to make your presentation in 17 minutes. And so we have time for a question from Svetislav. One question, because this is, uh, and I would like to ask both the panelists from Poland and from Romania, what's your, uh, what are the views in your country with respect to the digital services tax proposal? If, uh, you know, because there is an interaction, it's not, not a clear VAT issue, but it is connected with this and it's a proposal that's in the pipeline. Uh, and is there any debate in Romania or in Poland with respect to what the attitude of your respective countries is going to be towards this. Because it's fiscally meaningless. The effects are measured at around 5 billion euros of, over the whole union. So it's nothing. Uh, but but it, it could be a, a, a step which is which some countries are already contemplating and doing them by themselves. So I'm interested what, what's the Romanian and the Polish view. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so so far we haven't actually taken this uh, into consideration that seriously, and that's primarily because, uh, you know, we, we've had all these uh, other packages and proposals and whatnot in the pipeline, and some of them actually in the process of being implemented. And so we've we've focused on, on those, and, you know, we, we haven't actually um, reached the point to uh, to go into into those many details, but yeah, it, it's it's something on 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 our agenda, and uh, another aspect is that um, also um, so far Romania has been rather skeptical to uh, implement, let's say, um, l local uh, or, or na national. Um, Measures which are not necessarily uh, in line with the with with what the EU has got has got to offer. So other than the uh, VAT split payment mechanism, for instance, which although has nothing to do with the digital era, uh, so other than this, which is a purely let's say local measure, uh, it's it's skeptical and it's it's sort of like wants to uh, to to lie in line with the EU uh, framework. Sure, no worries. 
<laughs> so I totally share the impression. So also in Poland, the issue is not uh, very widely discussed. So we are just waiting when uh, when um, the idea is becoming like uh, um, more popular, and uh, then probably the Minister of Finance will will start real consideration of the of the idea. We have not implemented any um, domestic measures to to, to, to to deal with the um, with the taxation of the income that is generated by electronic um, electronic um, services we are just uh, waiting at, 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 at that point looking at what other countries are doing what is happening in, at, the, in the at the forum of the European Union so we will see we will see it's not a big issue right now not not a big discussion there are other topics being more discussed like um, like um, how to rise VAT revenue how to re reduce the VAT gap and uh, it's all more focused on indirect taxation regarding regarding um, um, also electronic um, electronic um, services. But generally, we are more 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 focused on the VAT gap, VAT revenue, not not so focused on taxation of the of the income generated. DST is is sort of a transfer tax. It's 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 a hybrid. It's not really yeah. income. It's it's. It's one form of indirect, on the special indirect. To I, I view it as a panic reaction. I, I don't yeah, think it's, it has any sense. Yeah, because it's it's meaningless fiscally, and big IT companies can pay it out of their petty cash, uh, all of it. So, uh, but but it, it can mess up the system. It can complicate it further, and it's it's a show where we. I think the French are, are actually driving the the whole thing right now. Oh. So, thank you. I have no more questions. You know that the, the European Parliament, there are now discussion about the, the temporary system to tax for the, the, the profits of those companies. And the, the, first, uh, uh, the first provision, the draft discussed in September, was a uh, tax of 3% on the turnover. And uh, it seems that. Uh, in October, it will be a decision in the in the Commission of the in the Economic and uh, of, uh, Administration Affairs of the of the Parliament, in order to let the state the member states to have their own uh, policy uh, in some limits, because many countries believe that three percent is not enough. Okay, thank you very much, Alexander. Thank now you. we have a problem because we have the third ex-PWC. <laughs> okay, so Christoph, please uh, take uh, the floor is yours. Uh, and uh, I want to thank to the, to the first two PW, uh, in, in, in office PWC colleagues for the way in which they explained because I, even me, I understood what they want to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello. First, uh, I would like to start with my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this great conference and great place. Uh, well, my presentation looks a bit different because, well, I don't work for PwC anymore. <laughs> Another point is that I'm going to talk about, uh, well, technology as well, but only up to a certain extent. Uh, because uh, what we've seen in Poland as recent developments was the introduction of uh, well numerous measures to combat VAT fraud, and some of them are well based on technology. So that's what uh, <coughs> that's what I'm going to to talk about. So we obviously have uh, well very numerous types of of VAT fraud or tax fraud. Well, some of them are as old as taxes. Yeah, and the reporting supplies. I believe it has always existed. Uh, and it still exists, obviously. So this is this typical phenomenon when you approach a supplier and the supplier asks you whether you would like to buy something with an invoice, with a receipt, or maybe without it. Typically, it's a bit cheaper if you do not ask for an invoice or receipt. But this type of fraud, fraud is not typically, it's not, uh, well, I would say, um, well, that bad for the budget. Uh, the types of fraud mentioned on the bottom of the slide, such as fictitious traders, missing traders, or carousel fraud, are obviously, uh, well, far more uh, problematic uh, nowadays. And obviously, 
Well, the point is, if we speak about, well, fictitious traders, missing traders, causal mm. fraud, the point is that if you want to protect the budget, then you have to identify fraudsters uh, very quickly before they get away with the money. Uh, and sometimes it's pretty easy, but in most cases it's difficult. And just to show you, well, the difference between different types of cases, just please take a look at the slide. There are some pictures in, uh, in, in the background. And my question would be, how much would you pay for them, provided that the artists are not very well known? Actually, they are not known at all in euros. Yeah, you see, like, how much would it be? Pardon? Ah, okay, <laughs> that's a good bet. <laughs> no, that was actually 250. Yeah, 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 but, but, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, in reality, uh, one of the paintings was, uh, was invoiced for 250 million, and that was uh, Euro, and that was, that was a fraud scheme, which was maybe, well, not the best one, and most if not the most efficient one, and it was quite simple to catch these fraudsters, yeah, but in most cases, it's not that, it's not that easy. Uh, okay, so speaking about, and that's a real story, yeah? Uh, in most cases, uh, it's not that simple, yeah? And we have certain measures aimed at combating VAD fraud. Uh, well, some of them are present nearly all over Europe. Some of them, uh, well, not that much. Uh, well, mo I would say that we could divide them into two categories, into these that are, well, nearly purely legal, so that legal regulation is more important than technology, at least. And then we have certain measures that are more technical, and law is only in the background. Uh, just to quickly go through all of them. Well, reverse charge is something that, that's very common all over Europe. Uh, well, probably I'm not going to, to explain how the reverse charge mechanism works, yeah, uh, as you are all professionals. Uh, but then, obviously, the problem that might arise is that if we cover certain goods, such as consumer goods, by reverse charge mechanism, then the fraud may start, or fraudsters may start acting the other way around. Yeah, so they may pretend uh, to be valuable persons when purchasing the goods, and obviously, if you purchase lots of con uh, well. IT equipment or electronic goods that are uh, uh, that can quite easily be sold to consumers without VAT, uh, then well, quite easily you can start underreporting your supplies. You know, you, so you switch into a different type of fraud. Uh, and obviously, when uh, introducing uh, reverse charge on electronic equipment, uh, certain legal and practical solutions had to be determined, had to be provided in order to il eliminate this possibility of, of for, for fraudsters. Uh, so we have certain technical measures. Uh, if, as a supplier, supplying electronics within reverse charge mechanism, if you want to be covered by, by this mechanism, and if you don't want to take too many risks, then you can only accept payments that are well basic registered, so either, either credit card payments or bank transfer payments, you cannot accept cash, yeah? So that's one point. Another is that, well, obviously there must be, be quick verification of returns, or not even returns, but rather recapitulative statements in that case. Okay. Well, another, sorry for that, for, 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 for what I've written uh, on the head. Uh, I'm not really going to speak about joints, sorry for that. It's only about joint and several liability. Uh, okay, uh, well, we have joint and several liability uh, introduced for purchasers of goods, uh, of certain categories of goods. Uh, well, I would say that, once again, uh, we do not have too much technology behind it, so that's, I would say, the most legal of all measures, yeah, because we do not really, we do, we do not really have to use any special technological solutions to identify those who are jointly and severally liable. Something very new, uh, we have split payment me mechanism, uh, well, which is present in a number of countries uh, all over uh, Europe. Uh, we have it, uh, we had it introduced in the beginning of, of July this year. Uh, so when supplier makes, uh, when the buyer makes payments to, uh, to a supplier, 
then the payment is automatically split into, well, this amount excluding VAT, the price excluding VAT, and then uh, the amount of VAT is automatically transferred to a different account, provided that the buyer wants to use the mechanism. So it's, well, basically the decision of the buyer. Uh, well, another legal issue is whether, well, the supplier can contractually agree with the buyer not to use this mechanism, but provided there are no any restrictions uh, in, in the contract, then it's the buyer's decision to use the mechanism or not. Uh, I would say that, well, there are lots of technical issues behind it, but all of them have to be solved by banks, yeah? So that was the problem of, of financial institutions to adopt uh, their um, systems to use, uh, uh, to make the use of split payment possible. Well, obviously, also, it's a problem of, of accounting systems that have to be, well, partly adjusted uh, to, to the use of uh, split payment uh, mechanism. Well, we do not really have that much experience, so we cannot now say whether it works perfectly or not, whether it works smoothly or not, but probably we'll see in the coming months uh, uh, whether the system works properly. Romania uh, tried to introduce a split payment uh, last year, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was almost an, uh, a strike of the accountants around the country. <laughs> and end of the day, it was introduced only for the companies uh, being uh, in insolvency. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it seems that the, prob the, the main problem is if that you as a customer, you are paying the VAT in a separate account under the supervision of the tax authority. The problem is how much time and which papers need your supplier in order to dispose of this money, to have the clearance from the tax authority to use this money. The advantage, but on the other side, the advantage of the system, I think that is that for the, for the customers of good faith, they will ne the, the tax administration will lose the possibility to say your VAT is not deductible because it was an, an fraud somewhere uh, in the chain of suppliers because you as customer you say I paid the money in an account which was under your supervision yeah. be happy yeah that's right uh, obviously I mean I would say buyers can always be happy when w they use this mechanism uh, because well it only protects them there are certain advantages for those who use this mechanism but well if we speak about suppliers uh, that's something that we don't know, but the rules are quite scary, I would say, because obviously the, the, the idea behind it is that, well, I didn't feel the need to explain it because it's quite obvious. The idea behind it is that, well, suppliers cannot freely use the amount, uh, the amounts of money that they have on their VAT accounts. And what they can do if they want to use them, uh, then they have to apply for, uh, uh, they have to apply to a tax office just to allow them to, to use the money freely. Uh, and the time limit for processing the request is 60 days. So that's incredible, yeah? But this is the limit. But, well, we don't really know uh, whether such uh, requests will be processed, uh, well, faster or, or longer, yeah? So that's, we don't really, we haven't had too much time to see how the practice develops. But 60 days, is, I would say it's scary, yeah? So that's, that's definitely true. Uh, okay, uh, what, what, what we also had changed, uh, well, mostly last year, starting from 2017, uh, well, we had a whole set of new, more precise rules of, of re on registration and deregistration or refusal of registration of, uh, of vulnerable persons. Uh, and, well, I would say the tax authorities started to check whether those entities that are registered, whether they were really uh, carry out any economic activity or not. Yeah, so that's something that happens. And well, provided that uh, whenever tax authorities believe that uh, uh, that economic activity is not really carried out, uh, they just deregister such an entity. Uh, sometimes even without informing that entity about deregistration. So it's possible, and there are legal grounds for such uh, for such behavior on the part of uh, of tax authorities. So it happens that uh, well, people really carry out economic activity, 
and just one day they're not registered anymore and they don't know about it. So it's, it's typically their customers that tell them, oh, sorry, you are not registered anymore. So that happens. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, well, a new database of deregistered um, entities was created and also of entities who were refused registration. Uh, so uh, as a buyer, uh, you have that opportunity to check uh, why certain tax number is not active anymore. Yeah? You can check, you can see the reason why tax authorities deregistered or refused the registration of a certain entity. Uh, and also we have some commercial software that incorporates uh, the data from the uh, provided by, by the Ministry of Finance, so such checks are made automatically by, uh, by commercial accounting, accounting software. Okay? Can I ask just one yeah, question? Uh, when you say tax office refuses to register... So you have to speak they... in the microphone. Okay, maybe this one. Or the other one. Please, the uh, translation. So one question regarding the, the registration. Uh, in Serbia, registration is quite automatic. Mm -hmm. You apply and you get it. But uh, in those countries, do they perform some substantial control to see whether there is economic activity behind? Well, I would say that now they have legal grounds for doing so. And sometimes they do. I would say that probably registration is, uh, is refused up front only in quite rare cases where tax authorities are nearly sure that a certain entity will not carry out real economic activity. Uh, well, to be quite truthful, there are no precise rules on how to assess this mm -hmm. well, prediction. Uh, but, uh, but then there are legal grounds for, um, uh, for refusal when well, you cannot communicate with the taxpayer or his representative. So these, are like these types of, of prerequisites. Yeah. And definitely, if you, uh, there are numerous different grounds for uh, deregistering entities. Uh, including such entities that just do not file uh, VAT returns in, uh, for a certain period of time, which is six months, uh, for uh, entities that file uh, returns but with no input, no output tax for a number of months, uh, but also any entities that cannot be contacted with. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. a number of, of reasons can be taken into account. I would say that it mostly works with deregistration mm -hmm. yeah, rather than with refusal. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that what, what, what's, more, what, what's quite important, and that's something that I mentioned in the slide, but these, uh, the data is quite easily accessible for everybody interested. Uh, okay, and then, well, reporting, we had um, well, quite serious changes in reporting, because, well, before that, so before 2017, uh, well, nearly every uh, entity could file VAT returns every three months, yeah, every quarter. Uh, well, definitely 99% of taxpayers could qualify for that. Uh, now, it's nearly impossible. Only a certain small fraction of, of small taxpayers can, can file quarterly returns. Uh, nearly everybody else has to file uh, monthly ones. Uh, well, obviously, the practice of fraudsters uh, before 2017 was such uh, that they typically registered for three months. So there was only one VAT return that they had to file. Uh, during the entire lifespan of a certain company. Uh, so now it would have to be a month, yeah, because there are no quarterly returns, nearly no quarterly returns, yeah. Uh, uh, well, moreover, this is something, uh, well, partly connected, there are more and more electronic, uh, electronic uh, returns, possibilities of filing uh, electronic returns and electronic uh, recapitulative statements. Uh, there are certain discussions which are quite advanced regarding introduction of e-receipts, e yeah? So it would also be a bit more uh, difficult uh, to under-report supplies. Uh, well, another point, uh, well, it, I would say that it's focused on VAT, but formally it, it applies to all taxes. It's a big data analysis. Uh, so now we have uh, that obligation of, of banks and uh, clearance system to report, well, basically every single transaction between economic operators uh, to, to the Ministry of Finance, and it's re nearly real-time reporting. And we have this big data analysis, there's certain algorithm which is, uh, well, not known to everybody, well, probably known to a couple of people at the Ministry of Finance, but not public, publicly known. 
uh, which takes lots of factors into <coughs> account to identify <coughs> potential fraudsters. And if you are uh, identified by a, well, by a computer as a potential fraudster, uh, then uh, uh, this well identification, this uh, this uh, well proposal uh, is uh, forwarded to a team of people to analyze it, it uh, once again. And then uh, it's possible that the analysis will end with, uh, with well, basically blocking your bank account for 72 hours in the very beginning, and then for up to three months, yeah, which, is, which is quite significant. Uh, uh, if you have your account well blocked by, um, uh, by revenue authorities, then you cannot really use it. I mean, upon permission from, uh, from the National Revenue Service, you can uh, you can make certain payments of salaries to a very limited extent, <coughs> and well, you can also uh, make certain payments uh, due to your obligations under family law, but it's also to a very limited extent. Yeah, so it's well nearly impossible to do anything. But once again, this is something very new. So we don't really know how it works in practice. Yeah, we do not know how many uh, entities and how many innocent entities will be affected, which is the most important question in that regard. Uh, well, another thing is that I just remember a conference that, that I organized a year ago regarding VAT before the introduction of the big data analysis that was attended by representatives of the Ministry of Finance who were in charge of that project of, of introducing this big data analysis. And they said that they had very ni nice trial periods uh, uh, prepared by the company introducing, uh, introducing this system. So they said that they wanted to identify a uh, probability of divorce using the algorithm, algorithm analyzing only financial data from bank accounts. And they advertised the system as being correct in 98% of cases. It's only 2% of failure. And it was the analysis restricted only to 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 the well, certain transactions. Okay, I'm finishing. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on this any further. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Okay, and uh, just one more thing, which is once again a bit connected with VAT, a bit with excise duties. Uh, so we have monitoring of transportation of certain goods. Uh, well, particularly fuel, uh, alcohol, dry tobacco. Uh, so we have certain numbers that are generated, are, are available for the supplier, for the uh, transport company, and then uh, for, for the receiver, uh, so it's just easier for tax authorities to, to check whether goods are actually moved between uh, different uh, locations. Uh, yeah, so that's this very quick overview of, 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 of our new solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It seems that all the countries in the region are experiencing all kinds of methods to try to, to fight against the fraud. Me, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm very happy when I have some uh, clients working with Serbia because I have the custom clearance and I can, that is a, an absolute proof that the, the supply left the EU or entered into the EU. I had surprises also in front of the judge. I have, for example, a guy who is exporting wood in, in the small village uh, nearby London named Oxford. And I had, including the confirmation of the British tax authorities via the SCAC, the Standing Committee for Administrative Cooperation, by this form that the, the goods arrived in UK, were registered and were paid, and uh, the tax administration refused, uh, uh, considered that uh, that is no proof of uh, intercommunity <laughs> supply and charged the VAT. So uh, it seems that the definitive regime will uh, solve this problem. Yeah, I just wanted to add very briefly that we also have certain disputes regarding uh, domestic supplies, uh, dis or exports disguised as, as domestic supplies. Mm -hmm. So it's nearly absolute, but not but absolute. Okay. Outside of okay. Borders, yeah. okay, thank you very much. I would uh, give the floor to Margot Jata. Uh, and I will ask her for the one minute to, 
to shortly introduce the, the center, the documentation center in the University of Uj, which in my opinion is one of the best equipped uh, documentation center uh, we have access and surely is the most friendly in my opinion at least. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bufan, for these nice words. Uh, so uh, uh, the institution I represent is the Center of Tax Documentation and Studies of the University uh, of Łódź. It's located in the, um, in the middle of Poland, in central Poland, so uh, you can easily access Łódź uh, either by car or by flying to Warsaw. And uh, I would like to, 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 to invite you to our center if you, uh, if you wish to carry out uh, research on tax law. Because we have a, um, a vast library collection with, uh, with the latest books being published uh, uh, internationally uh, in English. Uh, we have access to the IPFD database of tax research platform. Um, we, have, uh, we have lots of uh, tax periodicals available uh, at, our, uh, at our library. And um, whenever you wish to do some research to use, uh, to use our library, you are welcome to, to come to use the library. Uh, we also very often organize um, international conferences. Uh, the biggest one we have organized, um, it was the ETLP Congress 2017, so really, uh, really a big international uh, conference. Um, so, um, so wherever, whenever we organize an international conference, we will have, we will have try to, to, to forward this information also also to to you uh, via IFA network, so that you can you can come to attend the conference and maybe also use this opportunity um, to, to use our uh, to use our um, library. So please feel. Um, feel um, in, in invited. It's possible in the c Central and Eastern Europe to find a library with a really, really large collection of international tax literature. So English, German, mostly, mostly, um, mostly um, English. Um, okay, and uh, uh, now I would like to focus uh, on the um, topic uh, of measures, the technical measures that have been introduced in, um, in Poland uh, to, to, to just limit uh, tax fraud, VAT fraud. Um, and I'm going to, to focus on, uh, on so-called standard uh, audit uh, file for tax. Uh, standard audit file for tax um, is just a computer file that um, allows um, accounting data to be, uh, to be easily submitted to tax administration in a commonly readable format. So the data is, um, is contained in a file that is very easy to be read with the use of software of other institutions, uh, so software of tax administration generally. And because, um, because this file is standardized, it's not only easily readable for the tax authorities. It's also, um, it, uh, it also gives the opportunity to, 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 to exchange information between tax uh, authorities um, very, very easy. So if tax authorities receive files like that, they can uh, very easily implement the data into their own systems for analysis. <coughs> they can also very easily exchange this um, data within the structure of the tax administration, but also exchange this um, data um, internationally. The standard audit uh, file for tax was uh, was created by the OECD, so um, so it was an OECD initiative. The first version was published in 2005. Uh, in, 2000, um, in, in 2010, uh, the revised version has been published. And in 2016, the standard audit file for tax was implemented in Poland. It's called Unified Control File, and it's the Polish equivalent of the uh, 2010 SAFT uh, format uh, published by the, by the um, OECD. Um, when we look at the components of the Polish SAFT, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can see that, uh, first of all, the most important component, the most common component, uh, is the file which contains uh, um, data equivalent to the VAT purchase and sale registry. And uh, it's very important that this component is submitted every month by all 
VAT taxable persons. So all VAT taxable persons, except for, from those which are exempted from tax, so either as small entrepreneurs or just making uh, only exempted supplies. So all other taxable VAT taxable persons are submitting this file every month without being requested by tax authorities. You just have to do it. As you file a VAT return, you also have to submit this electronic file containing all information that is included in your VAT purchase and sale registry. Um, the other components of the, of the Polish SAFT are only submitted on demand demand, specific demand by, uh, made by tax authorities, and this demand can only be made in the course of tax proceedings, verification activities, tax audit, tax and customs audit. So there must be a formal procedure initiated um, within uh, which the tax authorities are auditing the, um, uh, are auditing, uh, the taxpayer, and only then the, can the tax authorities request for these additional elements of the SAFT. To be, to be submitted by, um, by a taxpayer. And interestingly, uh, these other structures, so these other, uh, other components, should be submitted in a time not, uh, not shorter than three days since the, since the demand has been received. So um, three days, well, maybe it's a long time, but generally it's considered to be a very short time, so, uh, so the uh, taxpayer has to be ready for a request like that. So all the data, in fact, has to already be has to already be in the system because three days it's not enough to collect all, all this data to to, 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 to to submit what the tax authorities are looking for and these on demand elements uh, contain for example bank statements so you have to input bank statements data into your systems already warehouse data uh, uh, but also detailed uh, detailed data on uh, on the contents of VAT sales invoices. So you already have to have this data in the system to be able to respond to the demands made by the tax authorities. Accounting books uh, can be also can be also requested, and the criteria to be covered by this obligation is keeping of tax books in an electronic form. So if we have an entity which sticks to the paper form of keeping tax books, such entity is not covered by this obligation. But, uh, but in fact, the number of entities that are entitled to, to, to stick to the paper form is also gradually being, uh, being um, limited. Uh, as for the VAT purchase and sales registry, um, all taxpayers, all VAT taxpayers are supposed to, to keep that purchase and sale registry in an electronic form. Um, this, um, these soft obligations have been implemented uh, gradually in stages, uh, depending on the size of the entrepreneur. Um, so, um, as regards the monthly VAT, uh, VAT files, so the VAT and per sales and purchase um, registry, the obligation has been already introduced in July 2016, but it only covered large entrepreneurs. Um, in uh, January 2017, small and medium entrepreneurs were covered, and, uh, and in January 2018, micro entrepreneurs were involved in the um, in the um, in the system, and it was a huge um, a huge change. Uh, when small when large small and medium entrepreneurs were covered by the system. Uh, 200,000 entities were submitting monthly, uh, monthly VAT control files. As of January 2018, 1.6 million entities every month submit the uh, VAT purchase and sale registry in an electronic format to the tax authorities. So it was really a huge, um, a huge uh, um, change. The on-demand on elements, so the ones that can only be requested uh, within tax proceedings and tax audits, they were implemented in uh, July 2016 as regards large entrepreneurs, and in July 2018, so very not not, not so uh, not so uh, long uh, ago regarding small and medium entrepreneurs and micro entrepreneurs. So now all these obligations have already been um, been um, implemented. 
the contents of the VAT purchase and sale registry is, uh, I would say, is very detailed. Um, the most important and the most burdensome element of the of the VAT purchase and sale registry file is um, is uh, data. Uh, regarding individual transactions. So whether you buy something or you supply something, your registry must contain um, data as the, as, the, as the tax identification number, the VAT number of your supplier or of your customer, uh, the date of sale, the amount of, the net, the net amount of the transaction, the VAT uh, connected with the transaction. So really very detailed data. The date of issuance of the invoice, the date of receipt of the invoice. So really very, very detailed data must be, must be reported to tax um, to tax um, authorities and of course uh, there there have been many difficulties when the uh, when the obligation was uh, was uh, was um, introduced um, first of all well the taxpayers had to, to had to uh, to bear the the cost connected with um, adapting or even implementing <coughs> IT systems when they were not using IT systems before. Um, it was, um, it was um, a clear, uh, a, there was a clear need to implement IT systems or to adapt the, the IT systems that have already been used. Of course, this uh, adaptation was easier uh, for those who were using uh, the commercial software provided by the biggest uh, providers. It, it, uh, it really worked very, um, I would say, very smoothly, but only for those who have been using the most advanced commercial software. For the others, using less popular software or using like their own software, uh, it was really um, a huge uh, problem. And the problem was, uh, was also um, bigger because of, uh, of the Ministry of Finance publishing detailed technical standards too late. Uh, in 2016, so when the, when the obligations for the large entrepreneurs uh, were uh, introduced, the technical standards were only published three days before the deadline for submitting the files. So they had like three days to adapt and to submit um, the files. Uh, the Best standard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the ministry, uh, well, one of the representatives of the minister said sorry. They, he really apologized to the taxpayers for And he resigned, I hope. <laughs> this is the best practice. And, uh, and uh, the other problem was that the ministry was promising dedicated software to be made available like free of charge for, for everyone. <laughs> but uh, also the taxpayers had to wait a long time before this software was made um, available. And uh, in the meantime, they were receiving like alarming offers of commercial software. So providers of this software threatening them, you know, you have not a long time to prepare for, so it's better to buy our software to pay us, not to wait for the, uh, for the free of charge software to be published by the Ministry, uh, ministry of Finance. Um, compliance support services were offered, of course, with very high, with very high mm, mm, fees. But now, uh, the software is is uh, is available. I will I will I will I will talk about it a bit um, <coughs> um, later. Uh, the problem was that uh, also uh, there was general guidance provided, general guidance, but no guidance for non-standard situations. So, uh, whenever taxpayers were, were fa uh, facing a situation that was more difficult, mm, more atypical, um, then they had problems, and they they <coughs> could, of course, uh, they could, of course, ad address individual questions and get answers, but uh, but these answers were not uh, not available to the general public. So everyone had to 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 to, to, to just submit um, a question. Another problem, not only adaptation or implementation of IT system, but also there are, there are significant costs connected with inputting additional data into the systems. So data which has not been uh, before um, inputted into the IT system. So it's a question of personnel. I mean, uh, more hours must be spent to, 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 to input uh, invoice data, transactional data. Uh, the personnel has also to spend more time uh, cross-checking data, whether, if, uh, whether the VAT purchase and sale registry is compliant with the, the VAT return to be filed. So also cross-checking data takes, um, takes a lot of time. Uh, 
the alternative is to implement technology. So uh, instead of uh, instead of inputting the data by the personnel, you can use OCR technology. Um, so so many calls, but the interesting there have been um, there um, there have been questions asked to the uh, accountants and tax advisors. So they all they all say that uh, that the amount of time spent on VAT compliance has drastically uh, risen, but they have the fees generally didn't go up. So more work to do, but not really, uh, not really, uh, not really that much more payments, which means that that some of the costs of the implementations are in fact uh, covered by by the accountants, by the tax advisors, and not the, by the clients themselves because the fees are not going up so uh, so drastically. Of course, there have been some facilities so from provided by the Ministry of Finance to make the compliance easier. So information campaigns, brochures, instructional videos. You can go on YouTube to 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 uh, to, 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 to <coughs> watch videos what to do, how to file the uh, file this data to the tax authorities. There is a help desk, a call center, uh, dedicated software is now provided by the tax administration. We have uh, also a choice between two software solutions. As you can see, the user manuals are, well, 32 pages, 92 pages, so maybe it's not so very, very easy to use this um, in the software. Of course, commercial accounting software, online applications are, are also um, available, and they are easier, I would say they are easier to use than the software provided by the uh, by the tax um, tax uh, authorities. What are the results of the implementation of the SAFT? Well, there is, um, mm, apart from these additional costs on the side of the taxpayers, accountants, and tax advisors, uh, there is more VAT revenue collected. Uh, there are less VAT audits, but these audits are better targeted. So. Not only, uh, not only the tax administration is more happy, but also taxpayers, I mean compliant uh, taxpayers are more happy because, um, <coughs> because the better targeted audits means that if there is a compliant taxpayer, if the data submitted by the taxpayers matches very, very well with the, uh, with, the, with the data submitted by the supplier and the customer, that probably there will be no audit because no irregularities are discovered on the basis of the data, um, data analysis. And these results, it's not just what is, um, what is said by the tax administration, it has been confirmed by our national audit office. They agree with the tax administration that, that the, the revenue collected is higher and that the, the, the number of audits is, uh, is going down, but the audits, the results of the audits are, uh, are much uh, better. Of course, the audits are also um, shorter, faster, that uh, the tax inspectors do not have to come to the premises of the of the taxpayers, so it's uh, they are not disturbing the daily the daily um, operation. They are not stressing the personnel, and the preventive effect. I mean, elimination of fraudsters. It, it's good for everybody. Less risk to be involved in a fraudulent scam scheme, and also less unfair com competition. And uh, and also, uh, well, um, for the for the taxpayers, when they are ready with the implementation period when they implement like e invoicing or e keeping of tax records after some time they um the vt reporting will become less burdensome so it's difficult in the implementation period in the first months but maybe then they will also benefit from uh, from these new technology new technologies uh, what are the plans for the future uh, the ministry is uh, has announced a plan to, to, to substitute because now we are filing uh, VAT files, so this uh, purchase and purchase and, and, and sale registry, and also a VAT return, so two files to file every, to submit every month. Now they are planning to unify it, so there will be a single electronic file um, um, submitted to tax authorities com containing all the information now included in the, in the VAT purchase and sale list and in the VAT. Uh, mm, return the, the data is not yet uh, not yet uh, available. Uh, in October 2018, they are implementing the obligation to submit financial statements also in the electronic form, in the standardized electronic form. They are uh, 
they are working on a central repository of cash register receipts, which means that cash registers will go online with continuous automated and direct data transmission to the tax authorities. So they will get not only transaction data uh, with the transactions covered by invoices, but also also uh, data when, when it, there's a natural person being the customer. So they will have really good uh, overlook of the, of the situation. And how do we look like in Poland uh, when you look at the stages of digitalization of VAT reporting and auditing? Well, uh, the last stage to reach, so the most advanced stage is real-time reporting, like the transaction is being reported real-time. In Poland, we are a bit, uh, a bit to the bottom, like with periodical SAFT being reported and, uh, and SAFT on, um, on the request, and also our VAT returns are filed um, electronically. As you can see, um, Poland is in fact among the leading European countries who have implemented SAFT. There are not so many of, of those countries, Austria, France, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Portugal, and, and Poland. Uh, Norway has implemented SAFT, but waiting until 2020 for it to become obligatory. Uh, in Belgium, the Netherlands the Swede, uh, and Sweden, there is reporting, but they are not using the standard audit file, but they own domestic uh, format for the, for, for the files. In many countries, um, taxpayers are supposed to, to submit periodical VAT reports with transactional, um, transactional um, data and who is implementing real-time or near real-time reporting. Hungary, Hungary is, uh, is in, in, in implementing, but there is, uh, there is uh, um, so in, each invoice must be uh, reported to the tax authorities if a threshold of the value of the transaction is, um, is, uh, um, is reached. In Spain, they have to report invoice data within four days since the transaction. In Greece, uh, they will be reporting invoices in real time, but starting 2019. And the, the most advanced solution <coughs> will be introduced in Italy 2019, a invoicing through a tax administration system. So it will not be possible to invoice, uh, to, to, to issue an invoice on your own. You would have to transmit the data to the tax authorities, uh, receive an authorization for the for the invoice, and only then you will be able to to send the invoice to your to your customers. So the tax administration will receive the data really real time, not after the invoice being issued, but will be involved in the process of issuing the the invoice. So 2019 Italy really a huge um, a huge uh, uh, change. Thank you very much for your. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now is the most difficult task for Filip Kovacevic, because if uh, PwC had uh, together about 50 minutes, I will kindly ask uh, Filip, although we should have a balance, to, to try to present his uh, uh, material in 15 minutes. And also, I will kindly ask Ciprian to draw the conclusion of this panel. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, good morning to everyone. Uh, I do have two good news for you to start uh, my presentation. The first one is that my colleagues have uh, managed to cover some of the items that I wanted to talk about, so I will indeed be able to, to uh, shorten it a little bit. And the second good thing for you is that Deloitte also has tax experts, regardless of what you have seen until far, <laughs> until uh, now, so you have choice when, uh, when choosing consultants. Okay, so uh, to begin, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about the SAFT, but uh, Magosta already covered that part, so I'll uh, switch immediately to the POPDV form. So the POPDV form is a newly introduced form that is submitted along with the BAT return as of July 1st, 2018. So uh, this is something that is uh, submitted along with the BAT return, and if you would think of the BAT return as a donut, the POPDV form would be the list of ingredients based on which the donut was made. So it has actual, actual purpose for the taxpayers and for the tax authorities, mostly tax authorities. Uh, in essence, uh, you have the possibility to perform a remote audit if you're a tax inspector. 
And if you look at the VAT return itself, it does not say much to you. So the Ministry of Finance decided to introduce this PDV form, which is a more detailed sort of a statistical annex to the VAT return, which allows the tax inspectors to focus on the ingredients that they are interested in, and so that they can pinpoint uh, problematic situations and identify risks more easily, both for the remote audit and then later on for the field audit if it is necessary. Uh, the POPDF form, in essence, follows the logic of the VAT return. So you have the outgoing supplies part, the incoming supplies part, and this is shown in the POPDF form as well. The only difference is, is that it is a little bit more detailed. So, for instance, you have, you have uh, how would I say it? Uh, a, a list of transactions uh, stated separately in this PLPDF form that can show the tax inspectors what are you doing actually. So they can see whether you have supplies in the construction industry. They can see whether you have supplies with foreign entities, etc., etc. Whether you're issuing uh, advance payment invoices, whether you're issuing debit notes, credit notes, etc., etc. So all of the specifics of your business are now being more readily. Uh, readable by the tax inspectors even before they come to perform an actual audit in, in the premises. So, of course, there was a lot of uh, fuss about this new form in Serbia, understandably because it was a, a, an excessive burden for the taxpayers. But like any cleansing storm, which is not pleasant at the moment when it is happening, it has its purpose. So, this actually allowed the taxpayers to reassess their VAT positions to recheck their systems, to improve their reporting lines, and uh, in essence to, uh, how would they say, to reduce the potential mistakes that they, are, that they might be making before the VAT audit takes place. So in general, it's a, it's a very uh, healthy exercise, and that is something that we have seen in practice thus far. Uh, we have seen actually the, that the mere fact of having this POPDF form on the uh, tax authorities' website reduced the amount of mistakes that are being made. Why? Because the system there checks the mathematical correctness of everything that you have stated in the PLPDF form, and then it also cross-checks it with the VAT return. So in essence, if you're making some mistakes, it allows you to pinpoint them up front before you submit the return, which is always good, because if you amend the mistake before the authorities come, then there was no mistake in essence. So. Uh, that's the, that's the uh, let's say, brief overview of the, of the POPD form and what it does. Uh, in future, it's still early to say because it's been ap applicable for only two months until now. But in the future, what we may see is probably the, the results that you had in Poland. Uh, so we should have the situation where less mistakes are being made, where less field audits are being taken, and uh, better compliance altogether is, is achieved. Uh, so that's, that's briefly about the POPDV form. Uh, I would also like to, to, to share uh, the fact that there is also dedicated tax software which allows taxpayers to automatically prepare this POPDV form available on the market. And through using this ad the additional tax software, uh, also some mistakes have been uh, identified in, in SAP and other ERP systems. And this was also a benefit for the taxpayers uh, on the, in, the, in the long run. Uh, and then to sum up briefly what we can expect in the near VAT future, and to maybe uh, make a combination of everything that we have heard until now, is that at some point in time, we will be submitting the VAT ledgers to the tax authorities. At some point in time, we will be issuing invoices through the tax authorities and their portal. And at some point in time, there will be a split payment me mechanism introduced, which in essence says that you're not paying the entire amount that you're invoiced uh, on the same account. You're paying the net amount to the one account and the VAT amount to, uh, to another, which is monitored by the tax authorities. So when you put all of these things combined, it's, it sounds a little bit like a dystopian future. But in essence, if you ask me, this is something that is actually very good because it's limiting the possibility for a VAT fraud to take place and uh, because the tax authorities will have the VAT ledgers, the invoices, they will uh, be able to, uh, to, to track the cash flow and uh, in that way uh, the, the VAT fraudulent behavior will be reduced, which is good for everyone. 
uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it will further reduce the need for the tax inspectors to come to perform a field audit and then to issue fines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So hopefully, I have managed to uh, save some time and uh, thank you for your attention. Philip, thank you very much. Thank you. This is a proof of efficiency in Deloitte. Okay, thank you, thank you, Philip. Thank you, Deloitte. Ah, so your time has to be counted also on the time of Deloitte. Yeah. Okay. Can okay. avoid me so. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It was an. Uh, I uh, I I hope that uh, uh, Serbia will uh, will progress and will not make the mistakes we are making in the other countries which are facing. Uh, many many problems since the since the accession of to the EU, and uh, I would like to ask Cip Ciprian to have no more than 20 slides, and trying also to uh, draw the conclusion of the panel because the best part is still waiting for us, meaning the coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Bufan. First of all, let me Shadow thank uh, Professor Popovic and Svetislav for the kind invitation. It's uh, really an honor and uh, I'm feeling like home here in uh, Belgrade and this is the most important thing, I think. Um, secondly, I will try to summarize. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, and what I'm going to say, my presentation is a, bit, a little bit uh, theoretically because I try to be a, a futurological expert and uh, I just I'm going to present you this slide because it, I think it's the core of what we discuss uh, today and this morning. So I think uh, the future is the future of digitalization in the economy, in the tax administration, and unfortunately I will say the future will be the future of a common tax administration regarding VAT in the European Union. So Svetislav very very nice addressed and question in the in the, in the uh, second or third presentation what is the sense of that uh, of that proposal it's a fishing expedition so the european commission and uh, the european union in general is trying to find the best solution to unify to transform national tax law in european tax laws uh, if you can look very very uh, very good at what is happening in the European Union with the decisions of the European Court of Justice in these 20 years, in the last 20 years, in the last 25 years. There is a common struggle of uniformity, of, uh, so to say, common policies, common understanding. Starting with the directives, it will go to regulations, I would say. And the first point was the so-called GDPR regulation which is not so important, but it's a fishing expedition. Nobody uh, put it in the discussion if data protection is, so to say, in the sole competence of the European Union, so that uh, the authorities of the European Union had the right to legislate with a regulation in that area. Nobody asked that because everybody said it is for the protection of the citizen. They will say in the future it will be for the protection of the administration of the VAT in the European U Union and to combat fraud, as you mentioned, because this is one of the main purposes of the Union, to combat VAT fraud. And how can we combat VAT fraud? As you mentioned there, in all the directives, in the regulations, you saw everything it will be through tax authorities. This will be the future. I'm, I'm definitely sure about it. But why don't we, so to say, why don't we Europeanize this administration of the VAT at the European Union level? This will be the next question. So if I will, if you allow me a, so to say, conclusion to this, uh, to this panel, I would say that the future will be a common future of the VAT administration in the European Union. I do not know if it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, the struggle is in direct taxation with the CCTTB, and I will die to hear our colleagues from the transfer pricing panel how they are going to combine transfer pricing with CCTTB. Uh, uh, so, as you will see, there is a common struggle to 
transform the union as it is from a political union to economic to, from an economic union to a full political union this is my understanding uh, I wanted to say just that uh, tax competition regarding VAT in the European Union in this era of digitalization is very complicated to, to, to discuss and uh, I think I'm going to show you, I'm going to send you the slides and you can forward to every participant. Thank you very much and have a nice break. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, Svetislav, you agree to try to be back at quarter to 12, okay? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, quarter to, uh, so 11.45, 11.40, we cut the break short. So 11